Hello, and welcome to this session of the 17th Annual Roosevelt Reading Festival, uh, the latest installment of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museums at Home with the Roosevelt's Virtual Programming Series. I'm Herman Eberhardt, the Supervisory Museum Curator at the Roosevelt Library, and we're excited to bring the Roosevelt Reading Festival back this year, and we look forward to reviving our traditional format on site at the Roosevelt Library in 2022. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our next Reading Festival speaker, Neville Thompson. And I invite you to join us for some Q&A in the YouTube chat that will follow his presentation. Neville Thompson is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Western Ontario, where he taught modern British and European history. A graduate of McMaster and Princeton Universities, He's the author of The Anti-Appeasers, Opposition to Appeasement in the 1930s, Wellington After Waterloo, Earl Bathurst and the British Empire, and Canada at the End of the Imperial Dream. This afternoon, Professor Thompson will be talking about his newest book, The Third Man, Churchill, Roosevelt, Mackenzie King, and the Untold Friendships that Won World War II. Many of our viewers are no doubt familiar with the famous wartime friendship and collaboration between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. In his book, Professor Thompson provides us with an extraordinary insider's view into the Roosevelt-Churchill relationship, a view that's provided by the third man of his book's title, Prime Minister Mackenzie King of Canada. Prime Minister King knew both FDR and Churchill better than they knew each other and he served as a vital linchpin between the two leaders during World War II. In The Third Man, Professor Thompson reveals the important but often overlooked role played by King during that global conflict. And he lets King provide us with intimate first-person insights into the thoughts and behavior of his friends, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. So now, without further introduction, I wanna welcome Professor Neville Thompson to this program and turn things over to him. Thank you very much, Herman, for that uh, kind introduction, and also for the honor of uh, being invited to appear at this uh, Roosevelt Reading Festival. It's too bad we can't be at the uh, library, though through the modern miracle of electronic communication, we can at least meet in this way, and indeed many more of us than would be possible probably on the site. Such telecommunication seemed like a Dick Tracy fantasy when I first visited uh, the Roosevelt Library in the spring of 1963, with no idea that I would ever write a book featuring President Roosevelt. This estate was the place that Roosevelt loved more than any other in the world, and where he would have retired if he had survived after a unique four terms as president in 1949. Looking forward to that, in 1945, he told Mackenzie King that his ambitious ambition after leaving office uh, was to publish a three or four page daily newspaper priced at one cent, which would contain a summary of events, but no commentary. Roosevelt was unmistakably an urban person who spent much of his life in New York and Washington, but it was here at Springwood, where he identified with and where, beside the library he had built, he was buried in April 1945. The only member of a foreign government who was present at the burial was Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, here for the fourth and last time, not in any official capacity, but as a friend of both Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Winston Churchill also came to Hyde Park four times during the war, and like King, found himself in a familiar surrounding on an estate similar to his own outside London and King's outside Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Roosevelt built the library and the wheelchair-friendly top cottage in seeming anticipation of leaving the White House uh, at the end of the customary and now constitutionally, uh, now constitutional limit of two terms in 1941. He was famous for concealment, and no one can tell exactly when he decided to run for a third term in 1940. 
But from what he said to Mackenzie King as early as November 1938, in other words, two years before the presidential election, it is obvious that he was at least thinking about it even then, two years before the event. By the time they met at Warm Springs, Georgia in April 1940, his inclination was clearly much stronger, despite confessing to King that he was exhausted, undoubtedly owing to a slight heart attack two months earlier, which his doctor probably did not tell him he had. In the next two months, May and June 1940, Hitler's rapid European conquest persuaded Roosevelt that he was the only person who could manage the dangerous situation for the neutral United States. It was the same events that made Winston Churchill the prime minister of an embattled Britain that was itself soon in great peril. There's no shortage of books and interest in the relationship of Roosevelt and Churchill, which is one of the great partnerships of history. What I have to add in The Third Man is the part that was played in the connection and the record that was kept of it by Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, which was the third most important Western ally in the war. King is scarcely known outside his own country and requires some introduction. Even within Canada, while no one denies his skill, which as detractors would say was guile, in being prime minister of a huge, diverse country for over 20 years between 1921 and 1948, his international standing is scarcely recognized. Yet until two years before his uh, retirement as prime minister, he was in charge of all the country's external relationships. In practice, this meant dealing with Britain, to which Canada was attached as a self-governing dominion within the British Empire, and with the United States, which was Canada's closest neighbor in more than just geography. From an early age, he was in fact a man of the world. He was not a parochial politician at all. Uh, he was a man of the world. He was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, the London School of Economics, and Harvard University, where he received a PhD in economics, though his subject was really social policy. He made and kept friends in both countries and was at home in the United as at home in the United States and Britain as he was in Canada. By the time he was 34, he had also traveled completely around the Northern Hemisphere, including India and Japan. He followed international relations uh, carefully, discussed them with Roosevelt and Churchill as knowledgeably as anyone else who was around him. In 1943, when the American and British leaders were dreaming of governing the world through what became the United Nations, the organization did not yet have a name, they judged that Mackenzie King would be the ideal frontline person to act as the conciliator between countries and to recommend when armed force was necessary against aggression. That was not how events turned out, uh, nor the United Nations, but it does illustrate the high opinion that the two leaders had of him. Of the many people outside Canada that Mackenzie King knew, particularly in Britain and the United States, Churchill and Roosevelt were the two most important for the Second World War. But this might not have been the case. There was nothing inevitable about Churchill becoming prime minister in May 1940, following a military disaster in Norway for which he was responsible. And Roosevelt might well not have run for a third term in 1940. Nobody else ever had. If Britain and the United States had had different leaders, King and Canada would still have been important between them, but it would not have been the same at all. Mackenzie King was the only person in the whole world who knew both Churchill and Roosevelt so well, particularly before they knew each other uh, following the Atlantic uh, Conference in August 1941.
The man seems to have been matched with the hour in Britain and the United States, and the same might be said of Mackenzie King and his role as a link between them, which was grounded on long association. King and Churchill, who were both 26 years old, uh, they were just two weeks apart in age, first met in Ottawa at Christmas 1900, when Churchill was already a well-known journalist lecturing in North America on his adventures in the Boer War, while King was just starting out as a junior civil servant. From 1906, when King went on a mission to the British government, to the colonial office where Churchill was politically the second in command, the two rising young liberals came to know each other far better. Churchill by this time had left the Conservatives in 1904 and did not return uh, for 20 years till 1924. In the next 30 years following 1906, to the beginning of the Second World War in Europe, they met eight times in Britain and or Canada. But this does not mean that they were always in agreement. They differed strongly over United British Empire foreign and defense policy versus independent dominions voluntarily associated on the basis of common values, institutions, and heritage. The latter was King's view, and he prevailed. Even more in the late 1930s did they disagree on the best way to avoid another devastating war only 20 years after the last. Churchill, who was out of office, wanted to threaten military action against Germany. King like most leaders in Britain and the other dominions and the United States, including Roosevelt, saw no reason to fight against incorporating German speaking territory in the Hitler's empire. Self-determination, meaning in effect language, had after all been one of the great principles of the peace conference at the end of the previous war. In June, 1939, when King came to Hyde Park with the British monarch, George VI and Queen Elizabeth, and it seemed that German expansion would be stopped by an Anglo-French agreement with the Soviet Union, King pronounced that Churchill was one of the most dangerous men I've ever known because he was clamoring for war. Roosevelt and King George agreed. But even at this and other low moments in their relationship, Mackenzie King still admired some of Churchill's extraordinary talents. After the war began in September 1939, and Churchill was appointed head of the Admiralty, King's opinion improved as Churchill boldly led the only armed service that was actually fighting, as well as broadcasting confident, morale-raising speeches that were heard around the world. King and Roosevelt, too, were apprehensive about Churchill's drinking and reputation for recklessness when he became Prime Minister in May 1940 and full-scale war began. But soon King was Churchill's strong supporter, though there were inevitably tensions between them from time to time. Mackenzie King and Roosevelt first met in November 1935 when they were both eager to, to, to conclude as quickly as possible a trade agreement luring tariffs on U.S. manufacturers into Canada and for Canadian products into the U.S. King had promised this during the recent election campaign, and Roosevelt wanted to get agricultural opposition out of the way before the 1936 presidential election. In 1936, the only states that Roosevelt lost were Maine and Vermont, the two that were most affected by Canadian agricultural imports. King in 1935 stayed at the White House where the matter was soon settled, and he and Roosevelt were instantly in harmony. But even here, as with Churchill, King made no secret of his criticism of the New Deal, which he considered bad economics, worse morality, and sure to ruin the country. King supported uh, social reform, good relationships between employers and uh, labor, and the virtue of private charity. But he was essentially a 19th century liberal, 
who believed that the economy would recover from the depression by low taxes and freer trade and that the state should stay out as much as possible. Churchill was of the same opinion and with the authority of a recent finance minister from 1924 to 29, uh, he also feared the consequences of the New Deal. Roosevelt urbanely ignored King Scribble and told the company at dinner, uh, he just met uh, King, but told the company at dinner uh, that he was an old and personal friend. This characteristic affability was at least accurate as a prophecy. Before the 1939 royal visit, they met four more times and then a further 15 to Roosevelt's death. And the president was always urging King to come more often. The most critical period that Mackenzie King acted as a link between Churchill and Roosevelt was in the year from the sudden capitulation of France in June 1940 to the German attack against the Soviet Union a year later, which temporarily at least provided uh, some relief for Britain. Neither Churchill nor Hitler expected that the Soviet Union would hold out long, but at least this was a temporary respite. In that pivotal year from 1940 to 1941, it seemed practically certain that Germany would at least attempt an invasion of Britain. If Britain fell, the way will be open for Germany to attack North America across the Atlantic and also from bases in South American countries which were friendly to Nazism. If that happened, Roosevelt was anxious above all to prevent the British Navy from falling into German hands, since the combined German, French, and British warships would overwhelm the US Navy. Before supplying aid to Britain, he wanted a firm assurance that the Royal Navy will be sent to the United States or to the British dominions from which it would join the American Navy in blockading Europe. In retrospect, there's no doubt that Churchill would have done everything in his power to prevent Germany from acquiring the ships. But in Churchill's early days, Roosevelt could not be sure of this. On Churchill's side, his best, indeed his only argument for essentially American aid was to threaten that a collaboration its successor, if Churchill were removed from office, might surrender the Navy in return for better treatment of Britain by the Germans. This was obviously a very delicate negotiation. Both Roosevelt and Churchill, who didn't know each other, acted indirectly through Mackenzie King, relying on him to interpret one to the other. There was no one else. Only King knew both of them. Apart from being a leader of Canada, which had also had a vital interest in the matter, there was, he was the only person who could do it. This was obviously highly stressful for King, who was well aware of the high stakes and the strong personalities with which he was dealing. It was his hand between the hammer of Roosevelt and the anvil of Churchill. Once Roosevelt was convinced of Churchill's determination, he provided material to help shore up Britain as a defense for the United States. First of all, 50 destroyers in exchange for American bases uh, and British colonies from the West Indies to Newfoundland, and then lend leased armament, armaments and food. Mackenzie King was immensely proud of his role as an intermediary on this and less dramatic occasions between the leaders of Britain and the United States. This is how he chose to be remembered in his official portrait painted just after the war. It shows him holding letters between himself, the British Prime Minister Clement Attlee and the American President Truman on the still secret revelations of a Soviet spy ring into nuclear research that was based in Ottawa. The only way that King could have improved on this image of being a link between Britain and the United States would have been to hold correspondence with Churchill and Roosevelt at some crucial point in 
in the war. The three Atlantic leaders met for the first time at the White House on Boxing Day, December 26, 1941, four days after Churchill had arrived following Pearl Harbor to discuss what was now a joint world war in both Europe and the Pacific. Since King knew the other two so well, no introductions were necessary. He just effortlessly entered into the conversation. And this informality continued throughout the war, and indeed afterwards in the case of uh, Churchill. The other two enjoyed King's company. They respected his skill and his dependability in producing whatever he promised and valued his judgments. There were also not many other people with whom they could find, confide freely, particularly during war when so much had to be closely guarded. Mackenzie King was a fellow head of a similar government and dealt with many of the same issues if on a different plane. So they were in a sense speaking to a colleague, a junior colleague, but a colleague nevertheless. He was also a person of the utmost discretion who never repeated anything unless Roosevelt specific, and Churchill specifically asked him to spread the word or to tell someone. They had no idea that he was recording everything in his diary. If they had, of course, uh, they would certainly have been less forthcoming. In many cases, King's diary is the only record of these conversations. Where there are others, it is always King's that provides the most detail, including the physical state of Churchill and Roosevelt, the tone of the meeting, the hope, the exuberance, the apprehension, the gloom, the drinking, and various other idiosyncrasies. Despite Mackenzie King's close relationship, he was never included in Roosevelt and Churchill's discussions of war strategy. This is a matter of much criticism in Canada, considering the country's great contribution to the war on the ground, in the air, and at sea, in addition to armaments, air training, food, raw material, and huge financial grants, gifts, not loans, grants to Britain. When Roosevelt, at the beginning of 1942, announced the year's uh, breathtaking production targets to Congress, these were what Canada, in relation to population, was already generating. Roosevelt, despite all this, even more than Churchill, was determined to keep the direction of the war in their two hands. If Canada were included, what about the other 20 allies that were fighting Germany, Italy, and Japan? What about the Soviet Union, which was always clamoring for more action by the West? What about acting Brigadier General Charles de Gaulle? He was really a colonel, uh, only a brevet promotion to uh, general. General de Gaulle, the self-proclaimed representative of France and a guaranteed mighty pain in at least one end of the spine. Roosevelt detested de Gaulle, hoped to find a better French leader, and refused to accept de Gaulle's pretensions until after the D-Day invasions. If there had been many representatives of countries at strategic conferences, there would have been a great risk to security and even more tension than there already was between the Americans and the British. But there's more to it than um, there's more to it than this. Mackenzie King willingly trusted the leadership of the war to Churchill and Roosevelt for their great geopolitical and strategic vision and their huge expert staffs, which were far beyond Canada's capacity. After Pearl Harbor, the British had a total of 9,000 representatives of various kinds in Washington. King had, uh, Canada had only a few hundred. King's only qualification in conceding the leadership was that Canada should be consulted when its interests were involved, though he knew uh, that this was often not observed. But if he was not part of the strategic discussions, Mackenzie King all through the war did have many important informal talks with Churchill and Roosevelt and the senior members of their team. And all of this is valuably recorded in his diary.
Mackenzie King's diary must be unique among major political figures anywhere in the world for its length and its frankness. He began it as an 18 year old university student and continued it to within three days of his death at the age of 75 in 1950. The document totals 30,000 typewritten pages, about seven and a half million words. In print, it would fill about 35 volumes, the size of the third man, and say 40 with annotation, which you would need to identify people and events. It is a miracle that it has survived. King ordered it to be destroyed after his death if he had not managed to go through it and mark the passages that were to be kept for his memoirs or an official biography. Otherwise, it was to go once those books had been written. One of his most important considerations was not to betray the sensitive matters uh, that Churchill and Roosevelt had entrusted to him during the war. As he said four months before his death, there were many secret confidences that I could not afford to allow others to see. In the year and a half between his retirement as prime minister and his death, King, who was suffering from heart failure, was never well enough to go to the task of rereading his diary. Three volumes of official biography taking the story to 1939 were published. And then one of the literary executors published four volumes of excerpts from 1939 to King's retirement in 1948. These four volumes were intended to continue the biography, which was never written. And since it was never written, these four volumes of excerpts serve as a kind of uh, substitute. Once this was finished, King's diary should have been destroyed. But fortunately, in the mid-1970s, the literary executors decided to keep it. Put it in the National Archives, was eventually where it was eventually digitized and now is available on the website. One of the most distinguishing features of Mackenzie King's diary is that it may, remains exactly as he wrote it at the time. There have been no alterations, no deletions, no alterations to improve his image or anything else. This is more unusual than it seems. The diaries of Lord Moran, Winston Churchill's doctor, for example, probably present the medical information on Churchill as it was recorded at the time, but many of the supposed conversations and perceptions were added later and endlessly rewritten, partly from information that Moran got from Mackenzie King, who was also his patient when in Britain. Moran's book is thus not so much a contemporary diary as a memoir. Mackenzie King's diary, has only rarely been used for international matters, and then usually from the printed volumes. But however lengthy those excerpts, there's still only selections by one of his former secretaries uh, who was involved uh, in events. One historian who has used the original diaries to very good effect is Nigel Hamilton in his recent three volume study of Roosevelt as commander in chief, which essentially deals with the clash between Roosevelt and Churchill over a second front invasion across the channel versus continuing to concentrate on the Mediterranean. One of the aims of the third man is to draw attention of others in the United States and elsewhere to King's valuable material. The Second World War, the largest in history, its origins and its consequences are weighty and solemn themes. But even at that grim time, there were moments of levity recorded by King that illustrate his close relationship with Churchill and Roosevelt, as well as adding to the gaiety of nations. Without his diary, no one would know in 1941 that King, who was always an abstemious drinker and had practically given it up for the war, stone sober, danced up and down arm in arm with a well-lubricated Churchill, while the other people at dinner, of course, were convulsed with laughter. In 1942, when by no chance his wife Eleanor was away, Roosevelt took King to dinner with his glamorous favorite, 
Princess Martha of Norway. And a month before the president died, King had dinner at the White House with him, his daughter Anna, and her husband, and a Mrs. Rutherford, who was introduced as a distant relative from South Carolina. She was, of course, Lucy Mercer Rutherford, the great love of King of Roosevelt's life. And King was so smitten by her that he actually had a drink. In their long associations, Mackenzie King made many illuminating assessments of Roosevelt and Churchill. I conclude with the last that he recorded of each. On his way to Roosevelt's burial at Hyde Park, he reflected that the president's death had so shaken the world because his greatness lay in his love of his fellow man, love of the oppressed classes and the gallant fight he made for them, regardless of classes and the bitterest kind of enmity and hatred. Three years later, as King himself was leaving the political stage, as it turned out the terrestrial one too, he pronounced that it was Churchill who was superior, the greatest man of our times. Not by any means the greatest in any one field, but rather in a combination of fields, in the aggregate. What made Churchill excel even Roosevelt was his great knowledge of history that enabled him to speak with authority, causing other men to realize how little their knowledge and vision really was. Mackenzie King was a spiritualist. Well, this was not known in his lifetime and it had no effect on any of his decisions. But whatever historic figures he communicated with in the great beyond, on earth, he worked and talked as he recognized with two of the giants of modern times. And to posterity, he bequeathed a priceless record of it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Thompson, for that presentation. Uh, certainly, Why don't you call me Neville? <laughs> I'll call you Neville. Uh, that is fascinating. And, and I think uh, we've got a couple of questions here um, to follow up. Um, uh, and first one is pretty basic. Um, what first got you interested in exploring uh, Prime Minister King's role in the FDR-Churchill relationship? Well, I wrote my first book on appeasement. So I've always had an interest in uh, sort of the period surrounding the Second World War. But more recently, in 2013, I published a book called Canada and the End of the Imperial Dream. The Imperial Dream being the idea that there could be a strong, united uh, British Empire, which would be a force in the world. And I became very curious about Mackenzie King's attitude uh, towards us. So after I published that book, uh, I began to read about Mackenzie King, uh, the, the, bio, the, the official biography, the volumes of excerpts and so on. And, and it occurred to me that, that there had to be more to this story than this. Perhaps I could produce a small book, that's what I was thinking, on King's perceptions. If I went back to the original diary and, and looked not so much at policy, but the way he assessed Churchill and Roosevelt, particularly Roosevelt, because there are some books on Mackenzie King and uh, Churchill, uh, but there is no book on Mackenzie King and Roosevelt. So I began to read the diaries, and they're absolutely fascinating. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of incidental uh, material. Mackenzie King was not a great literary stylist, but they're full of information. And, it, and as I read along, it occurred to me, there's a lot more to this than this. There's more than there is in the uh, excerpts. But those are very good excerpts. Four volumes, of course, is a lot, but Mackenzie King's uh, diary is massive. There is more stuff in there. Uh, so I thought of a three-way book uh, of the uh, three. So I sort of backed my way into it, and it became a matter of policy as well as perceptions. But it must be said that this is not a military history. It's primarily uh, a discussion of the relationship of three leaders, uh, their perceptions of each other, their interactions, their conversations, and so on. It's not a detailed military study. 
Uh, but perhaps the book will draw attention to many very good books on Canada's uh, place in the war, which somehow don't get integrated into the international story. You can read many general books on the Second World War in which Canada is scarcely mentioned. And yet mm -hmm. it made a great contribution, as I uh, said, without elaboration. Definitely a good point there. Um, uh, here's another question. Um, what was the most startling or unusual revelation about FDR and Churchill that you found in King's diaries? I think it, it, the question is about either of them or together. <laughs> well, that's a, certainly a wide ranging uh, question, isn't it? Uh, I think. Let's we just that... focus on FDR initially. What was the okay. most startling thing that you found in the diaries that uh, that surprised you about FDR? It didn't surprise me, but I, I think what there is in there, there's a lot about Roosevelt's physical state uh, mm. during the war. Uh, and it's quite clear uh, that he was not as well as represented uh, on, on, I, I mentioned 1940. On, on the eve of uh, Pearl Harbor, he told Mackenzie King, for example, that he could only manage to work uh, two nights a week. And it's obvious as the war went on, particularly uh, in the last uh, year uh, that, uh, that Roosevelt was failing. There's a lot of material in there, the King's uh, acute observation of just how frail Roosevelt was. Now, many years later, this is perhaps not much of a revelation. There have been many books, especially in recent years, uh, about this. But if Mackenzie King's diaries or a book based on them, on this matter, have been published, in the 50s, this would have been a matter of huge controversy at the time. Similarly with Churchill, I mean, he was a very acute observer of Churchill's uh, physical uh, state, mm. uh, especially when Churchill, when Churchill had taken on a huge quantity of alcohol. And Mackenzie mm. King, who scarcely a drinker of all, couldn't believe <laughs> how he could function so well mm. with all that alcohol. But as he said, you know, perhaps it's a matter of what you're used to. Uh, Churchill without alcohol wouldn't have been able to function like that. Uh, <laughs> so there are lots of these kind of incidental things. And as, as I say, when I started the book, I thought that would be what the book would be. It would just be a matter of King's perceptions of them, a kind of very s small book. But then I got that there's much more policy involved in here. I mean, Churchill and, and Roosevelt really did confide huge amount uh, to uh, King. I mean, imagine them in 1943. They're sitting around drinking and talking about how they were going to run the world. I mean, they took it for granted that after the war, they will be the two. Well, they'd have to include Stalin, of course, somehow. Uh, indeed, the, Stalin was crucial to it. He had to be brought on board. But they were going to run the world. This is they were running uh, the war. And so on. That, that was how they saw the United Nations. That was not how it turned out, partly because Roosevelt uh, died, of course, just as it was getting organized. Churchill was out of office, but also because it took a totally different uh, direction. By 1947, this has been examined in other uh, books, mostly by Mark Mazur, the United Nations was on a very different kind of anti-imperialist uh, uh, track, which, which Roosevelt and King had never imagined. Uh, Another question here. Um, how is King honored in Canada today? Well, it's, it's, his reputation is ambiguous. He's regarded uh, as a great political figure uh, because he stayed in office uh, for so long. But on the other hand, many people say, well, it was just a matter of guile. He was, I mean, Canada's a very big, diverse uh, country culturally and so on. Uh, not just the English and French speaking Canadians, but many others too, that he just played off one faction uh, against the other. So he's regarded uh, ambiguously. Uh, uh, but he's, So some people think he's a person of great achievement. Some people think he was not and so on. But what is ignored, even in Canada, is his international role. This is not very well known at all in Canada. It's generally assumed that he was heavily dependent on his civil servants for adv his advice in international affairs. And if there were any triumphs, it was because the civil servants were so clever and they, in a sense, fed him the lines. 
I don't think this is the case. King was very much a man of the world. He knew enormous numbers of people in political power and elsewhere in Britain and the United States. He knew his own mind. It was his policy. He had nothing to learn from his civil servants. He knew much more about the world than they did. So what I'm trying to do is to put Mackenzie King on the international stage, mm -hmm. both for the benefit of Canada and also for other countries, the United States and Britain in particular, where he was regarded as a major figure. We have a couple time for a couple more quick questions. Um, someone's asked, um, you, you mentioned spiritualists. What do you mean by spiritualist? The question asks. Okay, Mackenzie King uh, uh, was was a mystic. In other words, he uh, believed that he got signals directly from God. God didn't speak to him directly, but he got signals from God, especially when the hands of the clock were in uh, uh, perfect alignment and so on. He was also a spiritualist. He went to seances, uh, communicated. Uh, with his dead mother, with his dead dogs, even on one at least one occasion after the Second World War, uh, with Roosevelt, uh, who had a message uh, for Churchill. So, it, it, so he was a spiritualist in that sense. Mackenzie King kept his record of his spiritual seances in a separate uh, volume, apart from his main diary, and this is the only part that literary executors destroyed in the nineteen. 70s, mm -hmm. presumably because, I mean, they were people who were close to King. They were protecting his reputation. So they destroyed uh, the evidence of the seances. But there's enough in the general diaries uh, that it's obvious uh, what he was. Uh, so some people think uh, the Mackenzie King, I mean, scarcely uh, decided what tie to put on uh, without consulting his uh, dead mother or somebody in the other world. This is not true. I cannot find an example where Mackenzie King was uh, influenced uh, in making a decision. Rather, in talking to people in the uh, other world, he found confirmation of what he already thought and wanted to do. There's no evidence that Roosevelt ever had any kind of spiritual experience, but Winston Churchill did, and I mentioned it in the book, but it's well known. Uh, just after the Second World War in November 1946, just after uh, King had given Churchill a message from the beyond, uh, from Roosevelt. Nobody knows what it was because it's probably in those binders that were destroyed. Roosevelt, or Churchill rather, was painting, copying a, pic, a portrait of his father in his studio at Churchill, his country house, when his father suddenly appeared. So as King, as Churchill rather, said to King somewhere around the time, you know, there's much about the afterworld we can't know. Maybe he was just being flattering to King. And so, mm. But there's no evidence at all, none whatever, that there's any connection between King's spiritualism and his actions. We have time for one more question. Uh, and you may have actually mentioned this, I don't know, in your, in your talk, but um, are all or portions of King's diaries now available online? Yes, they are, uh, all of them. The only part that's missing is for, no, as I mentioned in the book, in November and December, uh, 1945. And this was the very important period because it was when he was discussing uh, the sort of uh, significance of the Soviet spy revelations and others. This was sp spy network into nuclear uh, research. Mm -hmm. These volumes, the first volumes in which he discussed the matter with the with the British Prime Minister Attlee and U.S. President Truman are there. But then there's a missing section. Nobody knows what happens to this. The best guess is that a civil servant who was copying King's diary, photocopying it, stole this section thinking to sell it or at least use it for blackmail, uh, perhaps for advantage in the government. But nobody is sure. Perhaps uh, these were volumes which were destroyed because they implicated people in the government. Nobody can be sure. When there are missing volumes, especially at the sensitive period, they're always bound to be speculation. Nobody knows. But if they were stolen, they might get turn up. But this is the only part that is missing. Anyone can go wow. uh, to Library and Archives Canada, look at the website, and look up anything on Mackenzie King, uh, in Mackenzie King's diaries. And since, of course, it's uh, digitized and computerized, if you want to say, look up Harry Hopkins, you just type in Harry Hopkins, wow. and up come the references. Wow, what a, what, a, what a resource. That's amazing that it's all available online. Um, well, wow, we, I, we could go on, but we're really running out of time. So uh, uh, we're going to have to bring this to a close. I want to thank uh, 
uh, Neville Thompson for joining us uh, this afternoon. Again, his book is The Third Man, Churchill, Roosevelt, Mackenzie King, and the Untold Friendships that Won World War II. Really a fascinating uh, book uh, and a fascinating diary. Uh, thank you, too, to our audience for joining us today for this Roosevelt Reading Festival presentation. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure as well as an honor.